Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So, in the design department here at the RSA, we, we're looking at the, the, it's not design in the traditional sense, it's the bleeding edge of design, it's new ideas in the design world, how design affects our future. We also run projects, and our major projects for the last seven months is one called The Great Recovery, and that's what we're here to discuss tonight. So The Great Recovery is firstly investigating the role of the designer in moving us from a linear economy to a circular economy. And secondly, it's actually making that change happen. A linear economy is when you dig resources up out of the ground. You then make it into something, and within six months, we throw away 90% things, 90 of things that we buy, and we put them in a hole in the ground called landfill. It's a crazy system. A circular economy, on the other hand, it mimics nature's cycles, and it demands us to think about systems. The idea is that nothing gets thrown away, and there is no such thing as waste. If you make things in the right way, then their constituent parts can all be reused. It's a much more sensible model for so many reasons. So looking at this problem, we realised that there are, there are many different people who need to work together. It's not just designers. It's consumers, it's the people who actually run the resource recovery and recycling centres. It's the brands who commission the design. It's the material experts, it's the policy makers. So for the last seven months, we've been taking mixed groups from these different areas of experts to recovery centres. We've been to see textiles, e-waste, plastic and engines. And we've been to see them be refurbished, reused, recycled or recovered. When we've been there, Mark Shayla here has been helping us run workshops where we take objects apart, we see what's in them, and how easy or, it, or difficult it is to discover the, discover, um, recover the constituent parts. It's been a very powerful process. There's something about when you take people out of their normal environment and you connect them with people they wouldn't normally be talking to, that mix enables people to start thinking in a completely different way. We've identified four key ways that designers can work with others to make real behaviour change. Again, the, the, I've got nice diagrams in this newspaper that I can't show you tonight, but if you have a look on page 14. Um, so the first model that we've identified is designing for longevity. So this is about designing products that last, well-made, well-crafted product, products that you don't want or need to throw away. And when they break, you'll know or can find out how to fix them. The second is design for service. Now, this is one of the most interesting. So new digital platforms and changing consumer behaviour are allowing us to share and lease products rather than owning or buying. Car sharing, for instance, Zipcar, is now common and it's an accepted practice. And, it's, and this model will soon roll out to other, other products. So I don't own a car, I use Zipcar. And by using Zipcar rather than owning a car, that keeps um, eight cars off the road. Number three is design for reuse and manufacture. So the cost of remanufacturing mobile phones could be reduced by 50% per device if the industry made phones easier to take apart and offered incentives to return phones. So designers need to work much more closely with manufacturers to see where that opportunity lies. Current obstacles lie in legislation where a product with a remanufactured part cannot currently be sold as new. How crazy is that? The last of the four design models is designed for material recovery. So at Recyc we, we've been going around visiting loads of um, different, different places and at Recycling Lives in Preston, uh, we saw these, these two TVs were, were lying ready to be disassembled and they were both LCD TVs and they have to be disassembled by hand because you can't crush them because they've got mercury tubes in the back. And there was a Philips TV about that big and a Samsung TV sitting next to each other. And the Philips TV had 300 screws in the back and every single screw had a different screw head. And the Samsung TV sitting next to it looked identical to me to the naked eye. It had 150 screws, so half the number of screws. 
Um, and it was exactly the same screw head all the way through, ironically, a Phillips screw head. Um, so the Samsung one was much easier to take apart. And the lesson from this is if, the, if you know your product's going to have a short lifespan, like TVs do these days, then design for disassembly. So these models can't be designed for in isolation. If you design for recovery, you need to design with a recovery expert. If you want to capture as many resources as possible at the recycling stage, then you need to know what's valuable and why. This means that you need a chemist and a material scientist sitting next to you. You probably also need someone who understands resource scarcity and business models. It's hard to make people change their behavior. We felt that we needed an incentive, a carrot instead of a stick. So we teamed up with the, Technolo the Technology Strategy Board to support their competition, which is called New Designs for a Circular Economy. And it, was giving away one, it is giving away £1.25 million pounds in, uh, as prizes for feasibility studies. And the competitions attracted entrants from all sorts of industries. Each winner was awarded £25,000 in the first instance, and that's not a huge amount for a large company, but it's been enough of a carrot to tip people into action. If they're half thinking about doing something, just having a focus of, of a competition and money seems to have been enough to bring people out of the woodwork. Companies have to collaborate in order to enter, which means that people are emerging from their silos and starting to partner with people that they're not accustomed to partnering with. And we've had really good cases of designers banging on companies' doors um, and you know, attracting attention with this competition. And it's important to show that government is behind this kind of innovation. So to sum up, we're looking at the future of design and manufacturing, how we'll make things in a resource-scarce future. We're building a UK community to drive forward the circular economy, to bring people out of their silos and to create better connection to encourage transparency and to deliver clearer information about how our products are made. We're rewarding solution-focused thinking and empowering designers to make actual change to business models in the real world. So um, what I'd like to say is that you could actually look at the sustainability crisis as a, as a crisis of perception um, and not just one of energy and materials alone. Um, you could say that it's as much to do with the human condition as it is to do with plastics, metals, and CO2. I try to understand why people keep certain things and not other things, um, where meaning comes from, why certain objects become quite meaningful, um, how attachments form, how attachments break, those kinds of things. Um, and through that, uh, I attempt to create design tools and methods and frameworks that build resilience into relationships between people and their products uh, as a way to extend product life, but also as a way to reduce waste. Um, and I call this approach uh, emotionally durable design. Now, when we talk about waste and, and, and um, why people throw things away and you know that kind of rapid, ever more rapid discarding of things. Often we think, well, it's planned obsolescence. You know, it's that kind of death dating, as it's sometimes called, of goods. If you actually mine a landfill site, which I have, uh, you'll find that it's not a graveyard at all because most of the stuff in there still works just fine. It's more of an orphanage, I suppose. It's more of a, I shouldn't be laughing, you know, it's more of a, it's more of a kind of a, a, a home for unwanted things. Um, and, and I think that's really, whilst it's grave and quite serious, I also think it's really interesting in terms of just design. I mean, you know, why are some things important to us and not others? That's a discussion that any designer should be interested in, never mind whether you care about the environment or not. I mean, that's essentially what design's all about. I began a course of design research which led me to discover that, you know, quite quickly that the term planned obsolescence comes from a guy called Bernard London uh, in 1932 who wrote a paper called Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. Creating solutions to social problems Sometimes we call it social innovation now, you know. 
That's a very relevant thing to do. Um, so based on the information Bernard London had at the time, planned obsolescence, brilliant idea. I think the only problem is, is that we've learned quite a bit since then. Um, so planned obsolescence, perhaps not such a good idea today because we know a little bit more about the consequences of uh, ever more rapid production and disposal of things. Um, so for me, that was an important realization because it kind of allows me to not blame and get angry about things. But I, I, I really feel very few people would consciously wake up one morning and, and say, I'm going to really do some ecological damage today. You know, I'm going to go to work and I'm really going to mess things up. It might be that there are various levels of concern about one's impact on the world. And there might be negligence, and we could talk about that a great deal. But I think that deliberate destruction, I'm not sure. I think there's a, there's a debate to be had about that. Thankfully, we're moving from this doom and gloom rhetoric, this kind of tired rhetoric of guilt and fear-mongering. And we're moving to a new story of opportunity and entrepreneurship and possibility and kind of hope, I suppose. So actually, this is a really fantastic time to be engaged in sustainable design because the, the story has moved on. And the thing that moves the pages of that story on faster are actually good ideas. I just wanted to highlight one point, really, it's kind of a, a story from our, our first inquiry into, uh, into closed-loop design. And it's really about making sure you design the right thing or try and redesign the right thing. Um, and when we, when we were first kind of tackling um, the world of closed-loop design, we've been reading a lot about industrial ecology and these kind of ideas of uh, industrial symbiosis and how you can more intelligently use waste. It seemed like a, a, an area kind of full of exciting ideas, and that n none of that was really being applied to kind of commercial products. Everything that gets sold onto the market in the UK uh, has to be uh, taken to an approved processing uh, plant. It has to be uh, disassembled, and the materials kind of get sold off and reprocessed. We went down to a waste processing facility. It's the place where most of the electrical waste from London gets taken, and uh, it, it was a, a really kind of eye-opening trip because it. it as uh, Jonathan touched on, there's just a kind of a mountain of dead products, and it's quite it is quite emotional as a product designer because these are things that uh, you know maybe they stopped functioning, but they probably stopped functioning for quite a minor reason, and it, a lot of things that people just kind of aren't fashionable anymore. So lots of things in kind of weird colour schemes all piled up together. Um, but the bit that was really striking about the the um, the trip was looking at the disassembly process. So this happens in various different ways. So some things are disassembled by hand, um, but we were kind of interested in the, in the smaller stuff. What happens to your kind of uh, your toasters and, and your hoovers and your and your kettles and all that sort of stuff? Uh, and they do, they get shredded or they put in, get put in a big drum and uh, chain swings around to smash them apart. So the kind of disassembly process, the the, the output is lots of tiny bits of product. So. That works quite well for things like metals, but then all, all the kind of uh, plastics all get mixed together and you get kind of broken up circuit boards. Uh, and, and it seemed kind of uh, bizarrely crude to me. Uh, so I was kind of questioning, you know, why, why is this happening? Why have we not got better disassembly processes? Because surely you know, there's, we could make much better material flows. Uh, you know, we, uh, there'd be lots of benefit to it. Um, and I suppose the long story short, the crux of that problem was that... Um, there's just no connection with the manufacturers making the products and the people uh, processing that waste material. A company called Orange Box who make uh, office chairs. Um, uh, they're in, in South Wales, a uh, really interesting bunch of guys. And they, they'd, they had quite an interesting story because they, they sell uh, kind of business to business. So they go and sell a few hundred office chairs at a time to you know, big companies. Uh, and, and they started taking back the old product. Uh, so they take back their old chairs, but also other people's chairs as well. So they had this kind of pile of uh, old office chairs. 
they showed us that their next kind of generation of, of chair had all these kind of really nice little design features in it. Everything just kind of pulled apart by hand. Uh, they had lots of really intelligent stuff with, um, they got rid of co-molded polymers and they'd kind of done some quite clever things with sure hardness of, of elastomers. And all the kind of, what we were thinking, oh, this is the sort of stuff that we were going to be designing, so the kind of intelligent disassembly um, features. And what we realised, we actually we kind of come to the project in the wrong mindset. Uh, that this wasn't this wasn't about thinking about the products themselves. This was uh, you know, the design challenge was much more systemic. It was how do you connect a manufacturer with the value uh, in uh, the waste materials in their products. So it wasn't necessarily these design features. It was the fact that they'd started taking their product back, and that they could then see it was very obvious. All these kind of um, questions of efficiency of assembly all start to happen automatically. You know, if I take my own product back then I suddenly have this drive to innovate and come up with lots of clever ways to, to disassemble my product. And none of that kind of exists when you have a kind of a broken system. So I, my sort of point on, uh, on problems and opportunities is that this is a kind of, you could have easily missed the mark and designed something that, that actually quite a few of them might have gone through a shredder. And uh, really the design challenge was in the kind of the services and the systems and the logistics of getting the product to the right place. Uh, and, and making sure that really uh, that's the critical part, then everything else will just kind of happen naturally. I've, I've long said that design is the single most powerful environmental tool that there is. It, it, undoubtedly, it is. Uh, I'm, and I'm left wondering why it's still being misused and, and how we can stop it. And I'm going to start the questions rolling because that is my prerogative um, by, by asking the panel, why has design been misused and how can we, how can we harness it for good? I, I mean, I, I suppose it, it's been misused and it hasn't in a way. You know, I think we've, we've uh, you could say that through design we've actually achieved a huge amount. And the design story is, is as I say, an evolving, changing story. Um, but I do think that it's perhaps a story that's lost its way a little bit and perhaps become a bit too subservient to the notion of economic growth. Um, so perhaps design is, is seen as a means to um, a means to generate economic growth, you know, as a priority beyond any other. What you touched on at the start, Jonathan, is design post 1930s, which it, it, everything was very functional pre then, and then as we did become a bit of a tool for growth, and uh, and the, I suppose the upshot of that is that we got very good at making things desirable and we just became really good at making things sexy and making them sell which you know that's not a bad skill to have you can go through sort of design education and you just uh, you can you know seduce people into purchasing things so that's designed to manipulate want rather than to to solve a problem it is yeah just to kind of, just sort of evolving that that question of planned obsolescence and, and, and and I suppose when you think about the misuse of design it, it's in that it's in that facet that you think, well, you know, should we should we not be focusing our attention to, to better things? But still, you know, it is it, those skills are still relevant in making things desirable and 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 kind of um, Jonathan's philosophy on, on uh, emotionally durable. That all those things are kind of how you create a connection with people uh, are really relevant. It's 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 just how we kind of redirect that focus. So it's it's less about uh, kind of sales, and it's how we how we yeah, reconsider growth, that actually there's, there's lots of design opportunities for achieving growth that uh, can kind of decouple uh, growth from material throughput and all these kind of ideas around the circular economy are, are really elegant ways of doing that. But ultimately, yeah, we still we come back to the question of, uh, of the, the financials of this, that there still need to be products that people want.